very big warm welcome to everyone who's here this evening, um, especially those of you who've come for the first time to be here. Um, this talk is hosted by the archives at NCBS. Uh, this is a this is the 57th edition of the archives public <laughs> series. And for those who before, I mean, for those of you who are here for the first time, um, this public lecture series is a set of monthly talks trained around explorations in and around archives, which includes discussions by artists, activists, academics, lawyers, teachers, journalists, and others. Um, we are really excited to have with us here today, Dr. Peggy Newman, and uh, she'll be talking about migration and the making of language in South Asia. And to do a really quick introduction, so before you begin, Peggy is a visiting professor at Ashoka University, Delhi. She began her life in Trinidad and the West Indies. She has a PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan. Um, she has taught linguistics at Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University in Jamia Media Islamia, among other places. She uh, has contributed to reputed publications such as Equal and others. She's also the author of three novels. Her latest book is Wanderers in Sport. Um, and this year, earlier this year, it won the Martin Bumi Book of the Year Award. And um, she also informs me that she's working on a new book. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, greatly looking forward to it. And without further ado, here's Peggy. Yeah. Let's see if I can preface this by giving you some sort of context. I assume that very few of you here are going to be linguists, and you don't want to hear about language for its own sake. You probably want to see how it links up with other things, which may be things that you're doing in the hard sciences, in archaeology, in genetics, um, in pure history, in the looking at the written record. What we tend to find is that each in itself is a little incomplete. And here is one more source of data which can help to flesh out what could have been history. And in this case, since it's such a rich subcontinent, the history of South Asia, uh, you don't do that going into the dark without a flashlight or any kind of a compass. So the compass that you use, as in a lot of sciences, is a model. So the model has been something that one has been through this book that I wrote, and much more in the book that I'm writing now, where I'm very happy to see that events in ancient India or the pattern and language evolution in India is a much better guide at times to how things have happened in the world than the things we've accepted from Western scholarship, like there were pigeons and there were creoles, and then came, you know, some move towards a standard language. But in fact, some of the old models that we had, that there was something called a prakrit, where does that hit into it? So that linguistics can give you a means of adding a little detail into data, which is sometimes very, very bold, like genetic data. And I'm going to try to see if I can do that now. So I'm going to take you back as far back as I can go. And as far back into the past as we can go is probably, now, what does this say? Wrong. Let's go back to first Indians. First Indians, you see in a nice date of 70,000 years ago, which is the approximate date that geneticists have given us for when the first migration happened out of Africa. The people who left Africa at that time, crossing from Ethiopia, Somalia region, did not go to Europe and to the rest of the world. They crossed in an ice age. Ice age simply means, some of you know this already, that that yellow arrow is not going to be the one that we're looking at, which the Europeans tend to think of as the first migration out of Africa. No. At this time, 70,000 years ago, you couldn't cross the Sahara Desert. It was a desert. However, the place where people crossed out of Africa 
would have been relatively shallow because a lot of the ice was held up in the glaciers, the polar glaciers and maybe glaciers elsewhere. So the first Indians were in many ways the first people out of Africa. So our history goes back somewhat that far. So these people, uh, it's a very, all my maps are hand drawn. Uh, and that's a sketchy line because it was probably more inside what is now the nation right now. Initially, when they came to India, now, how long did they take to get to India? That's a very important figure. The geneticists tell us something like 5,000 years in transit from where they crossed to when they reached the roughly the Indus Valley area, which is the beginning of South Asia. 5,000 years is a very long time to make that journey, which allows me to say it was not a migration. These people were not migrating. They were not going anywhere in particular. They were spreading out. Why were they spreading out? Because they saw animals and they saw uh, vegetation that the animals were feeding on, which encouraged them to keep going. So since they were not going anywhere in particular, but simply moving, we don't call it a migration. That's very important because one of the things that you find is that these, this was the migration into India that brought the maximum percentage of women. Women are very reluctant migrants and we will find very few of them in the future. So if there are women in India and population in India, and India always has been an attractive place for migration. It is because of this first bunch of women who came across and were there as potential wives for later migrants. When they came to India, India was not uninhabited. It was inhabited by hominids, but not humans. So we're going way back so the first migration out of Africa, what does that tell us? What can, we, what can we say about the people who came? How did they speak? Obviously, that's a hugely long time. I am reluctant, even when we have the best possible evidence, like in the Andamans, to say there has been no change. But there are a few things that we look at which seem to have endured. One of them I would look at is grammatical systems, the languages were more complicated than the languages we have now, much more cross-marking. Those are the things that seem to have remained. So early human language was not simpler, it was much more complicated. But here's one thing that you're going to find that's familiar to you, to every one of us. This is the same map. You see, if you look earlier, you get in the, it ends somewhere on the right. I haven't taken it further. Here I have. I mean, I've colored and shaded all the places where you get one thing that has to have been in the first Indian languages, which is there in almost every part of India, except Assam, which probably did not get it, and the far Northeast. And that is something called retroflexion. Retroflexion is very simple to understand. I, I know Hindi, but I know it's in every language of India. Uh, and whichever ones it's not in, it was in it 100 years back. Okay. Retroflexion is like the difference between the word dant, tooth, and dant, which means scolding. D and n are not the same as the and n. That's very unusual in the world. Uh, there are very few languages that have this. Once you get outside of South Asia, you're not seeing it. But if you go beyond South Asia, you begin to see the central New Guinea, which had the same migration as first Indians. It was not population replacement, or Australia. If you hear Australians speak, many people say they really sound like they're speaking power. <laughs> and they do. They say, no, or la, the. Uh, and they're talking like it's sounding like Uttanar and Punjayil, it's not a flat kind of sound. And the problem is, so we don't see it outside South Asia, but we see it there. 
which tells you that the one that Australia only had its contact with India and Africa in that first migration. So it's fair to say that even though we like to say that these sounds are Dravidian or South Indian, they're not only South Indian, they go back to before there was anything remotely resembling a Dravidian. And some parts of India, as you can see, like them more and develop them more. And some places they faded out a bit. Look, you see the lines going into the Andaman Islands. So the Andamans also had this. So why have I chosen some? There are two things that tell you a lot about the past. They're not words. Words are the easiest thing to change. This morning, what I was wearing was different from this. I look different. Uh, but what did not change was my genetics, my bone structure, various things inside me. So we are looking at language in terms of what cannot be changed. You could just erase all the Urdu words and create something called Shubh Hindi. You can take or uh, Malayalam and stuff it full of Sanskrit words, but the genetics of the language is going to endure. So we try to look past the words and see what the genetics are. And we see in Ethiopia and Somalia, a certain proportion of this duh and duh. Not Maybe not the others, maybe the rest was lost. Maybe it was there once. Uh, we see, hmm? we look into Australia, we see it. Uh, <laughs> Central New Guinea just turned, uh, Andamans turned, uh, tribes turned, uh, and they have a and crazily enough, if you look, I could have taken that uh, dark brown line further north. Punjabi has the kind of features that uh, South India has. So this, this is apart from, and it has, of course, other things too. Like how many of you knew that Punjabis cannot say herd, herd, herd? It does not exist in the land. They have problems with it. They avoid it. So you begin to see already through just looking at sound, some kind of a picture of who we are beneath the clothes we wear and what we pretend to be at that at the moment. Now, what is retroflexion? You may wonder about it. Everybody who's done phonetics has seen this thing. Uh, the green is the it's dental, it's behind the teeth. The orange, uh, it's curled backwards. By the way, uh, is not retroflex. So I'm uh, up for grabs on to where it came from, when it came, what it's doing in the South Asia, but it's not retroflex, it's something else. So we're still really only looking at uh, and up in the far northwest, into Pashto country, into Sindhi, into the Karakorams, there's a sh, which, also, which is also in Sanskrit. Yeah. Okay, so in the middle is a white tongue position, which is behind the alveolar ridge behind the teeth. So it's a t. It is neither t nor is it t. So many languages tend to either choose one of these positions and stick with it. Malayalam, of course, has to tap all three. <laughs> I don't know how they survive, but, they but the point is, South Asia is known for mostly having these two positions. And that, as I said, takes us back to history very far in the past. It takes us back a good 70,000 years. It's pre Dravidian. So these are the sounds. I don't need to go into it. It's interesting that that era uh, exists and because it's not in Sanskrit. It is in Punjabi, but yes. Uh, but it's not in Sanskrit, but it was in the Prakrit, which tells us even Sanskrit at some point had to approach these sounds when they came into India. And every single migrant group that came into India, their children started using these sounds. Why? Well, let's see, you come to it. Yeah? Quick glance, you need two white spots there. Those are two Munda tribes which should have had 
turn, turn, turn in contrast, they don't. But if you look at the data from 100 years ago, which exists, they didn't seem to have it there. Yeah, I mean, they were beginning to waver. So 100 years is nothing in the context of 70,000 years. So a very old feature just began to fray at the edges somewhere there. Quickly, you see much more in the south. Why? I'm not very sure, except I have a mistake. Yeah, you notice that L in, in um, brackets? That book can go a bit higher. It's in Punjabi. Certain R. Yeah. So, or Northern Dravidians. <laughs> so, until then, we were only talking about one group. Now, let, let me take it back and discuss what do you, what, when you have only one group, uh, which slide is this? I am numbers. Uh, ah, reach my second page. So what happens after this? There must have been migrations into India, individuals all along. But we are not interested in the little man who came and settled down and fitted in with his neighbors. We are interested in the ones who leave a genetic trail, who change the politics of the country, who force small formations into larger formations, create kingdoms and so on, who had more technology. So we're looking at the empowered migrants who came in. And the first ones that are of note under the genetic record are the people from the Zagros Mountains in southern Iran, you know, the Iranian farmers. And they had a few things going for them. Obviously, they had domesticated crops. And also, as a sort of person, why did they come? Uh, one student once asked me that, why would they come? Farmers don't move. I suspect that men generally do move. And there's enough evidence from looking at them genetically that this group were mostly men. What do you do if you're a man and you migrate into a place like South Asia? You either go extinct because men do not have uteruses. They just do not have children by themselves. Men in fact, when men make up languages, men make up pigeons, and those, do, those also die with them. So the point is, what makes durable languages? So obviously then, moving on into families. And how do you have a family if you haven't brought women? So you have a set of relationships that come up, and it's initially in the Indus Valley, between the early hunter-gatherers, the people who we call the first Indians, who by then had obliterated the other hominids and ruled the country. We don't know much about how they ruled or how varied they were or what all they taught. Some of their languages still exist. We can tell a bit. Uh, but then they met these slightly more developed people from the Zagros Mountains. So who are the Dravidians? The Dravidians are neither. The Dravidians are actually both. So it is what you get is a kind of a fusion that happens very typically when men migrate into a new place and meet local women and have children. So the children are a fusion of both sides. And both sides simply means that these are the, the migrants of the men and the mothers who bring up the children until the age of five, give them their first culture, their first language, their first notion of what sounds should be in contrast to the other women, and they are local. So there's this continuing foundation in the Indian population of the early women. But here come these men, and Together they form what was probably not called anything like Dravidian. It's a very relatively new word. It's late Sanskrit, by the way. It's not even a South Indian word. It's a useful word because um, the Brits took it and 
uh, used it to describe two different sets of languages. However, these people were the proto form of what would have become Dravidian languages. What were these languages like? We actually don't know anything about what these men brought in. Because as far as I can make out, there's no other part of the world that has a link to the languages that we know now as Dravidian. Where? So did they all come to India? We don't know. There's a lot that we don't know. However, the people who made the Indus Valley civilization <coughs> had, were the result of a kind of fusion and something very unique to South Asia and to that part of South Asia. Now, why did they move? I suspect that the success of their culture, not, not climate change, but the success of their culture is that once you have farming, you have a surplus population. And a huge population means one thing in migration terms, that a large number of young men are ready to move. So they may have moved not because they were getting, uh, or they were uh, not able to survive, but because suddenly they want room to live. We see this all over the world. We see it in the animal kingdom. I'll show you more of it. So they moved on because of the population surge, and we don't know what happened to the rest of the Zagros Mountains in terms of language. What kind of language would they have made? Well, the grammar and the sounds, all these lovely things, would have come, remained from the women's language. But the beauty of a man's group, an empowered group coming in, is they donate that very visible thing called the vocabulary. So you would have got a vocabulary based on first Indian languages, which were already being, still being spoken in their pure form in other parts of the, uh, South Asia, but they got a new vocabulary on top of it from the kind of men who uh, participated in this fusion experiment. Now, so, now, as I said, pigeons are not a part of our model. They may have existed somewhere in India at times, but if you have, um, Part of what I promised to tell you is what happens when people can't speak to each other. Obviously, ad hoc languages come up. But uh, when you have a situation where the migration is permanent, it's not like a trading situation between uh, one group of hunter gatherers and one group of settled farmers or wishing to settle farmers. When you have permanent migration and taking local wives, you get a new generation which learns the mother tongue. We have a lot of populations in the world elsewhere, in the Caribbean, for example, where, for, where um, centuries ago, men came in and killed all the men in the tribe and married the women. And to this day, boys are brought up speaking a different language from the girls. These things somehow seem to persist. However, they do tend to fuse, and the thing that prevails tends to be the mother tongue. The grammatical structure that remains in whatever goes on tends to be from the maternal stream, and the paternal stream tends to be the one that this gives the vocabulary. Let me take it forward. I showed this, I mentioned it. Look at the top. Who can't say Bhad Gharja? Two parts of India. Interesting. I, it raises a very big question. I'm not going to answer all the questions. I don't know the answers. Why is that white center in the middle? Why can Maharashtra say Bhad? Why can tribal Bunda say? I don't know. But the point is, we have a similarity which continues from the very north in the in this valley down to the south in in grammatical features and in some of these sound things. So 
I have a dream of someday sitting down and writing out a Punjabi song with the uh, Tamil now. We know how it sound. I suspect it will work very well. In fact, your son-in-law, when he went to Japan, he used to speak Japanese, and when he didn't know a word, he just put in a Tamil word. And the Japanese thought, hmm, maybe it's a technical word we don't use. <laughs> it worked. It worked very well. Okay, why do migrate? I went on a migration myself a little while, a few weeks ago, to Masai Mara, and uh, I wish this was one of my pictures, but uh, it wasn't so focused. It, this is not a clone picture. This is called a Thompson Gazelle. And we were going by, and we had a most wonderful guide who really was knowledgeable about a lot of deeper issues to do with animal birds, and he said, this is a bachelor herd. And the word bachelor is a familiar word. Like in the West Indies, male migrants from India were called bachelors. Moglasias is translated as bachelors. Bachelors means that if you, the men who went, even if women went with them to the Caribbean, no, usually not even their wives. Just some stray woman who's bold enough to go. But here, yeah, this whole herd is about is male. What's going on? We went on a few more steps in, or in the jeep and saw a fully female herd with one alpha male with huge horns in charge and one youngish male on the fringe. And our guy says he's about to be driven out of the herd. So here is an interesting thing. This is not a mistrust situation. This is basically the nature of how this particular social formation goes. So there's such a thing as a surplus male. So the continuity of the herd is the females, on, and the alpha male himself will want to be deposed. So the idea of men migrating, leaving their families, leaving and not ever planning to return is something that's not merely human. So when people ask them, why do women not migrate? I can't answer you because I see it with bears, I see it with gazelles, I see it with a large number of animals where it's very normal for the male to migrate. And that's an important thing to bear in mind because that explains quite a lot of how India was settled. It's not just, we're going to keep going, and everywhere we look, we're pretty much going to see bachelor males coming into a new territory and finding probably herds of women, surplus women too. I don't know. Let me see. So, how does this evolve into a model? All our lives we've been told. But such and such a language is descended from this. This language is descended from Sanskrit. This, um, this belief that there's a single descent line or ascent line or whatever you wish to call it, and that it goes up like a tree and then it diverges into branches, and there's no way the tree next to it is going to have a role to play in how this tree develops. So you say then that. Um, Hindi is an Indo-Aryan language. What does that mean? Nobody here, you, you may all have family surnames that go back to your father, if you're from the north at any rate. But that's not your only parent. So quite a lot is not being addressed in the idea of a single lineage that you belong to. There is something more like two lineages. Now, I'm very sorry you have seen this animal before. In my book, I talk about a tiramisu bear. Tiramisu bear, there's only one way you will get. Tiramisu bear is my daughter's word for this hybrid of a, a polar bear and a grizzly. What is, how do you get a tiramisu bear? There's only one way. You cannot have a polar father because the polar father will never leave the ice cap to go south to find a mate. He cannot walk on barren ground. So the only creature that could possibly move is the grizzly. 
and the grizzly female being female does not migrate. So the only way you will get this kind of fusion is a male grizzly going north, maybe because he's waking up earlier, and unfortunately in the same time as the polar, female polar bear's mating cycle, he goes north and finds that there's no ice flows, these things are on land. He should not be meeting her at all. So he meets her, they have offspring with a characteristic set of features. For example, the paws will be something in between a grizzly set of paws and um, polar bear, somewhat furry. If you've ever seen um, these animals' paws, they don't slip on ice. And if you ever owned a pair of boots made by Inuits in the far north, you will never, you can, you can run on ice, you don't need peas. They are basically gone. They've got fur, haven't they? So that's why they can run, but they therefore are very vulnerable on regular ground. So here you have this kind of animal that's a metaphor of the kind of languages that get created in. in migration situations where the mother is local and never moves and the male has come into that area. Now, okay. this is not the only migration that we've seen in India. We have another migration which happened before the Vedic people came to India, just slightly before, 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years was a very important time in South Asian history because that was the time the Indus Valley collapsed. That was the time this migration in, took place and possibly around the time the South was settled. So it's a very landmark time. But here came another migration from the east. How do we know it was male driven? We know very little about it. The linguists thought a hundred years ago they heard something like Vietnamese words in the tribal languages of um, Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh, uh, the Munda, Santali type languages. Where are, what are the, these Vietnamese? or to some extent Thai words doing there, and they let it be. There are some other things archaeologically that made them think that, yes, there are people similar to first Indians in that area. It's true, they, they were, but they were killed. They're not there anymore. But what happened was there was a migration. The geneticists recently worked on exactly when Japonica rice came into India and found that that was 4,000 years ago with a bunch of men who came in. They shared their genes with local women. I hesitate to think of whether that was a pleasant thing or not, or whether men got killed in the process. Did the men run? What happened? But there is a certain amount of uh, quite a fair amount of genes from Southeast Asia in our tribal population in this area, not, not in the South and not up in the far North. So it's all on the male line. But when you do the same test looking at the empty DNA to see the maternal line, you're getting like zero. They essentially brought no woman and then they came in. And what did we get? We got languages which don't look anything like Southeast Asian languages, except for having some vocabulary. So again, you see that the maternal line holds steady and you have the kind of old tribal languages that were always uh, spoken, that to this day you get whiffs of them in the Andamans and so on, but you don't get uh, you don't get any of the tone type things you get in Southeast Asian languages. We did get one thing from the Southeast Asians, which is interesting. Since tribal people probably did not have such developed number systems, 
when you import a new notion on numbers from an incoming migrant group, you import other things with it. There's a kind of a gender system that comes only with numbers in the East and all over Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Tibet. It has, it's there now in the entire Eastern part of India. Anybody here knows Bengali Ekta? Uh, that that's, comes from Southeast Asia. Uh, and Ekkon, Ekjon, it has the highest form of um, differentiation in Chinese and Japanese. But so you see something could leak in that is more substantial, but a few words leaked in. But otherwise, you got a continuation of the kind of old grammatical structure. So India is getting populated. So far, we have seen two sets of males coming in. The people who created the Dravidian uh, family and the Southeast Asia. To this day, people, linguists love to say that the tribal languages of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh are Austro-Asiatic languages. Now that blows my mind. Two minutes ago, you were saying they were first Indians. Now you're saying that they're actually Vietnamese. Now you need a model which knows how to reconcile. Yes, they are both. And they're both in a particular way. We imagine that the number of men who came into a huge land like India cannot have begun to compete with the population already in existence here. The women were always outnumbered, the men. And the local populations, not all the men were decimated. So you got an influence from outside, but a huge continuity. Let's see if we see another. We know this one, right? This is the Vedic people. Again, male driven. How do we know it's male driven? Again, the, the geneticists. So we would not have known about the migration from Southeast Asia if the geneticists hadn't discovered in the by testing out the tribes in the um, Jharkhand area, Munda speaking tribes, that they had a strong line of Southeast Asian genes. We wouldn't have known exactly what was the nature of the influx of Vedic people. We call them Vedic people. I assume not all were writing or composing Vedas, but the point is we do know that initially when, the, when people were trying to say, okay, so like people came and brought Sanskrit. In those days, we only had the empty DNA tests and they did not show up on it. All we found is that this, the history of India was continuous for untold thousands of years, more than 10,000 years, maybe 12,000 years, maybe more. Who were these people and did they come at all? And then they tested Y DNA, which means you can only get the male descent line. They suddenly discovered men had come. Now, what is why am I telling you about the uh, Vedic people? Because they are, for me, a very useful form of doing something which matters to me, which is getting enough data to improve the model. They tell us a lot about how things happened. So you again get a situation where we know a bit more from the Rig Veda. We know a bit more about a lot of memorized stuff that was not written down. And we are aware of them saying things about so and so spoke Prakrit. They knew our language, but they weren't us. There were certainly men who picked up uh, the Vedic language. We don't know exactly what they spoke like when they were not composing. The Rig Veda, but uh, the Rig Veda I'm referring to because it's the earliest. There was quite a lot of influence in later Sanskrit. We don't want to look at where it's already been influenced, but we are assuming that when Sanskrit first came into India with these men, there was no they were not there. 
we we find when we look carefully, we see how they came in. 700 years later, it was discovered that let's note these things down. And by then, people had in their Sunday rules and so started using them quite a lot. And this was noted down. But even so, what nobody tells you, if you look at a page, now you can see it visually of Sanskrit, of Rigvedic text. There is dharta, dharta, and sha, a very little of it. So it's not only a matter of um, whether it's there at all, but how much of it is there. If you, the further south you go, you go to Maharashtra, there's quite a lot. You go to Kerala, there's an awful lot. So you're seeing something that is increasing. And if you look at the Prakrits, the Prakrits from the north sound like some Malayali was trying to recite Sanskrit and bringing in an accent with no very little other changes and accent different. So the Vedic men came into a place where people had sound systems, grammatical systems, which are similar to the kind that we now find in the South. And uh, because their children grew up with these Prakrits and the, and the original languages as first languages, they, it began to leak into the way they spoke Sanskrit, the way they even composed in Sanskrit. And why? Because unlike other languages like English and Persian, it was not written. So over centuries, left to yourself in what's called a shakha. Shakha in the old days simply meant a family, a family group of Brahmins. Um, then far off the beaten track, just reciting the Vedas to each other, the first um, mandalas of the Rig Veda, it begins to change. It begins to adopt more of these Dravidian sounds, what we call now Dravidian sounds. They're actually older than that. So what's beautiful in this is that looking at the entire story of Sanskrit allows us to see how long it took for certain things to leak into the language with population mixture, uh, what kind of grammatical features leaked into Sanskrit that are different from say, what are there now in the South? Makes us raise a lot of questions that, was there something different in the North? In, in the Dravidian spaces in the north from the south? Uh, were they more happy about gender? Were they more happy about some of the other things that you don't get in South Indian languages now, like the uh, buy me food kind of structures that you're very familiar with from the north? So what was good is that this allowed one to uh, refine the model and to think of, let me see if I have spelled it out. <clears throat> yes. So you have Sanskrit coming in, then comes are all around it are approximations of Sanskrit, which are I put it in the same color range, Prakrit, so essentially just Sanskrit with a different accent. You think about it, you get your, your friends write to you, you read their academic papers, you have it's a very a soundless interchange that you have. And then the minute they decide that they're in a hurry and they send you a WhatsApp voice recording and you hear a Marathi accent as big. And you hear this guy's from Kasar Road and not from Cochin or you or you hear this strong Bengali accent and you suddenly realize this is what must have been hitting all the Vedic people the local accents that they couldn't possibly miss because everything was oral. However, they weren't speaking badly. Anybody from Britain hearing me speak will probably think that this is not English like I learned. But if they saw me writing it, they probably wouldn't have too much objection because it will fit in with international English and same with all Indian English. There's not much difference. So the Prakrits, the best example of a Prakrit that I can give you is not bad English. 
it's this English that we speak. So the Brits came, they spoke their English, we speak ours, it's that close. So by the Prakrits are not a halfway margin, halfway house between what the migrants brought and what came up later. They're, they're just a nice local people uh, accommodation to a new influx. However, this is the question, the thing that we don't know enough about, but we can guess if in India there wasn't too much interference with very ordinary local people. Remember the IBC culture in this valley, the Harappan culture was already an agrarian culture. It was somewhat developed to the extent that uh, when the culture itself folded, the people were still there. What were they doing? Farmers were not probably going to be interacting with Vedic men in, in their battles. They were not interacting with even the kings of their own people. If they were left somewhat alone, they were probably continuing to speak their earlier languages. We have no idea what those languages were. They have vanished in the Northwest. But we can imagine that they stayed around until at least 500 AD, maybe a little later in some cases. So here's the model. Sanskrit and the Prakrits, these locals who meet them and learn the languages very well. That's the first step, not a pigeon. Then meanwhile, they're all still speaking the local languages. Later, because of other forces in the society which uh, cause either proximity or maybe a, over a very long period of time as the population grows and gets absorbed into the new culture, you start seeing what's called the vocabulary replacement. The thing that we call English in the North, and you must have words for it here too. You begin to see vocabulary leaking in without an attempt to do more than simply replace vocabulary. And it's easy to see in the tribes in the um, Munda area, because if I can read the data and I'm not lost, it's because words from my own dialect, which is right next to there, are leaking in. I'm familiar with it. So there's a slow, gradual process. Uh, and after a certain point, when people begin to want to either write or they begin living in towns or whatever, you start finding that it accelerates. Then you have these languages which have a very different grammatical structure. I mean, the old grammatical structure is still there. The words have changed. That's a description of almost every language of North India. The so North India has either the old Munda type languages of the East, onto which came new Prakrit words, not Sanskrit. The Prakrits were close enough because there was, those were the little rulers in the small areas. Then, or in the Northwest, uh, every single, not just nouns, every verb, every ending. If in Tamil you say Vital in the house, correct? Yeah. In Sanskrit you can't say that, you would say Ghare or Grahe. Grahe. Grahe and A is a locative case ending. You don't have cases, you say Ghare me. Me is for fulfilling. Me has come from some proper source, but what is may? May is basically ill. It is completely replacing an earlier notion on how you string words together. So you have the <coughs> old um, agglutinative structure of a Dravidian language, um, but we've pulled in Sanskrit type Prakrit words to express the same things. So here, so when you say that 
uh, Hindi is from Sanskrit, though it's from the Prakrits. You haven't understood that Gharme is actually Vidil. So this is a good example to show, and we have a number of others in uh, other areas of grammar. Okay, so you're, you're seeing the vocabulary replacement on top of what was there before creating these mixed languages. These mixed languages, the model that one appeals to is the Creole model. <laughs> Again, the Creole model is it's a layered mixture. The grammar and to some extent the sounds remain from something else, the words from something else, from the migrant language. Am I going a little too fast and too, you, you can ask me questions later. Now, this is not the only one we have. Okay, here's a, this is something I made, this is my terrace. So here I once referred to this as uh, an image of Malayalam, but it's as much of an image of any North Indian language too. If I asked you what you see when you look at this picture, you will tell me you see probably an octopus. But the thing is, it's a flaw. And the octopus species are not a flaw. They don't have any substance. They can't stay there. They need a matrix. And the matrix is the cement and the white stones that you fail to see because they're not as interesting as the image of the octopus. So to think of it in terms of Malayalam, you immediately, the Sanskrit words leap out at you. But in fact, long before there were Sanskrit words, before there was an octopus terrace in my house, there was a white floor. And it worked very well as a floor. So the only way this could work in is if there was cement. And that cement we take for granted. That cement is the grammar that holds it together. And it's very interesting that a matrilineal system, the word matrix, which is, means cement, is that thing that binds the language and so easy to overlook. And that the old philologists uh, who worked on Sanskrit and old Indian languages were obsessed with words and the words of these fellows who can't even make a flaw by themselves. So to see the completed flaw, you have to understand how they fit with something that was there before, and that's prepared to hold them in place. Now, where am I going? I'm not even looking at my notes. So what you get to the end, I'm not, I put a different color for Sri Lanka because I haven't, it's so iffy as to what color I should have made it, but green is the migration from Southeast Asia with all the Ekta Dutta and Ek John. Uh, and Assam, of course. In Assam, there's many more. Why? Because they are being good. Things are not static in this world. In Bhojpuri, in my dad, there's only one. We don't even, if John kind of faded out at some point. So we have Nepal, oh, I haven't got to that yet. I wish I could tell you what I'm going to write in a few months, but I'm going to work on Nepal. Nepal is a crazy place where because of Tibetan influence, all the impossible things are there together. You know, so I do I dare to call that chapter the the duckbill platypus of South Asia, no. <laughs> but it is. But here, look, we're all the way down here, and then Maharashtra, and this is a very funny configuration, ignore it for a moment, because um, at the bottom of the Indo-Aryan zone, uh, we have a twilight zone where we have Dakini and Southern Marathi. Uh, where the influence of Telugu and Kannada has done some very interesting things. So don't, don't think about them too much yet. However, this huge, huge area uh, is one kind of North Indian language, which 
we think of us having a Dravidian base, but not exactly the same base as the South Indian language. And a few things are not there. Two things are different. And then we have the Northeastern zone. These areas are tribal areas of few hundred years ago. So these are modern languages. When did they come up? Okay, how do modern languages come up? How oh, did these languages, these languages are not modern, they're old. In some ways, they're older than the languages of uh, like Sanskrit and Prakras. So they are the languages of what I call the little people who held on to the old grammars and brought in new words from the Prakras over centuries. But how did these come to be the languages that we know? Because there's another time in Indian history that's extremely important. 4,000 years ago is important. The 12th century is very important. 12th century is when pretty much all the North Indian languages and even Malayalam in its present form uh, came into existence. And you need to know that it has nothing to do with grammar, syntax, verbs, nouns. It is a political thing. What was happening in the 12th century that allowed the little people to unseat a huge order of people who were operating the land in Prakrit and Brahmins still working in Sanskrit? What happened? And I've been trying to think of what it might be from, is it that they overthrew Buddhism? What did, what happened? And slowly looking at things like what happened in the Bangladesh area, what happened in the Deccan. The, these languages were there below sea level, not written. Writing started, but more important came the Sultanates. The Sultanates have no reason to love the old Prakrit order. And if there were people around who wished to experiment with things called Bengali, in its more modern form. Delavi, Hindi did not, wasn't called Hindi. Delavi, the dialects of Raj, Abadhi, early Marathi in its many forms, uh, the Punjabi type dialects. If there was anyone who was willing to give them a space and help them unseat the Prakrits, it was the new Sultanate. So it takes nothing less than political backing to change an old order. So I'm giving a fast, fast glimpse of how am I doing time-wise? We are out of time. Huh? We're out of time. We're out of time. Now we will just show in the last. No, no, let's go. We are out of time. Again, these two. These, again, these men from Uzbekistan. We believe that there were some women here and there. Again, a male driven migration of people in the Sultanate, the Sufis who came, later the Mughals. Again, and they unseated the earlier uh, Prakrit based uh, spread of power across the land where little people were somewhat below sea level, not seeing the light of day. Here's the last slide, you don't need to go with it. And just to cap to you, then we, we're back to the present somewhat. Who are these other people who came? Forget the French, yes, they came, the Portuguese. Mostly men, the British, when they came, they had one interesting thing, younger sons. These were the bachelor birds who came to India. They couldn't have done very well in Britain, and Britain was fully uh, exhausted in terms of what their opportunities were. They were very glad to have a place like India to come to. Women did not come until the Suez Canal was built. So you had the initial influx of British into India was no different from the other stories. And interesting, what are the languages in India which stand out? as not being part of the pack. Sanskrit doesn't look anything like an Indian language. Persian doesn't look Indian. Ahom maybe, yeah, English. 
all the other languages which have evolved and put it around accommodate these age old pressures of that maternal base across the land. Now, I, you see if this makes sense to you. This is how I am structuring my model. I'm going to be taking it forward because I want to look at, uh, for example, how did the South get settled? And as far as I'm concerned, why would it not have been men from the Indus Valley slipping south? But I haven't reached that yet. But I have to use my imagination to see what is possible before I start looking into whether that is what happened. Because we're so far back in the past that um, the data is very sparse and we have to know where to start looking for it. I'm going to stop here because I can see I'm out of time. Am I? Very badly out of time? Uh, well, we have time for maybe two or three questions. And I then think as many questions as you want. And then people can join us for child measurements yeah. outside. Okay. Will you feed them? <laughs> <laughs> or... Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. when... So you've uh, answered a lot of questions in my head about my own language. I speak Malayalam. Uh, so loan words in Malayalam when I was studying Spanish, Mesha, Mesa was the one thing that uh, stable. Mm -hmm. It came from Portuguese and Spanish, all of that. Uh, the one thing that I've always found uh, as a problem for me in learning other languages is the conjugation of verbs uh, <laughs> used, uh, taking into consideration not just, so we, we'll just look at past tense. Okay, oh, okay. I'm so I have thought about this since I was seven years old because I struggled to learn Hindi because of this, which is conjugating verbs using gender and number. Malayalam is very easy. It's the same word. Malayalam is too easy. It's in fact, it's shockingly easy. It's so easy. And something, it shouldn't be so easy. I don't know why it is. The pronunciation, I guess, makes up the difficulty. No, you've got rid of a lot of that in English. And, and for me, I, I feel like it, it still conveys a lot of uh, the meaning. For example, the, the example I use is he came, she came, they came, I had one, I had one, I had one. It's the same, the same one. But not in anywhere else in South Yes. Place. I thought it was a Hindi thing. And then when I came to Karnataka, I'm start, starting to learn Kannada. It's, it's very difficult. So something happened in Malayalam around the first century. It's not a very old thing. Yeah. yeah, so my question is, why is that so? Uh, because even in Spanish, they do accommodate yes. for numbers and gender uh, when you're looking at the same tense when you're speaking. But if you can speak to what happened in Malayalam where it became so simple. I'll talk to you, not just Malayalam, because after all, the Northern Dravidians have this issue too, which is to say the Punjabis <laughs> and the Sindhis and the people in the Karakorams and so. Um, I'm glad you asked this question. It's a question I really think is the most interesting of the lot. I have a theory that South Asian thinking processes are very known heavy. They hate verbs. There are a lot of that we were talking in the way back in the car. You can't like something. To me, there's like and like is a noun. You know, there's quite a, and if you look at conjugation, you can have these long interchanges. Kama jana, kab kab jana. We don't conjugate the verb at all. So, and in South Indian languages, the verb to be can be just thrown out. The first sentence of a paper reads like it's heading. You don't know if it's a heading or the first sentence of the paper. There's something in South Asia that dislikes all this kind of, the kind of verbs that you get in Sanskrit the kind of verbs that you get in Spanish, the kind of gender system that you get there also links up in a very funny way to a choice that was made. What do you want to do? Do you want to conjugate verbs like you were talking Sanskrit? No, you do not. So let's make the verbs into nouns or adjectives. If you make a verb into nouns and you say I, not I do, but I am a doer. Are you a female doer or a male doer? Suddenly gender becomes an issue. 
if you say food eaten by me, uh, food eaten, eaten is an adjective. Adjectives will agree with nouns, but that's okay. But if the noun is a gender, the interesting thing is that the in this valley area was more happy to deal with gender than it was to deal with what we are talking about. They hated the verb conjugations and pretty soon they started knocking them out of the Prakrits, knocking them out of Sanskrit and bringing late Sanskrit somewhat more in line with what the modern languages are, which is what we are talking about. But in the North, it was done at the cost of bringing in gender because I am a doer and you are a doer. We are not the same gender of doer. Do we have gender? Well, it seems that there was something in the North that did not mind it. There's something in the Deccan that does not mind gender. There's something in Southern Maharashtra they hate saying, by me food eaten, it's I ate. But they don't mind gender. So gender is the less of the evils but the verbs they just do not like. So it's a very interesting feeling of what is an ethos. I was asked by a friend to edit a manuscript she wrote, uh, a science fiction book. And I said, okay, I'll great, I'll get a chance to see data, to look at Indian English data. They are over the place, I would underline places, things that I would have written as a verb she wrote as a noun. Uh, they were worried because of the advent of Diwali, because Diwali was coming. You know, you look at Indian English, it's not wrong. It's very proper. It's the best proper I mean. All over where you can use a noun to say the I needed a man for definition and something else to, to define me. Hello, you don't want, so there's a, there is a dislike of playing with, with verbs. In Spanish is the opposite. You can't land on the moon because the moon is land. Uh, the moon is not land, land is earth. So you have to moon on the moon. <laughs> so, you, so what you would ask is raise a little on its nest because gender somewhere in the middle was seen as something we could live with. But we don't want those words. So even in Sanskrit, by the time of Kalidasa, you're seeing these texts where it's reading like Hindi to me. I look at this is this Sanskrit. Uh, um, what is it? Uh, when Chakundala says, uh, by, by sharp pusher grass, my foot pierced. There's no is. And pierced is an adjective agreeing with foot. You know, even in classical Sanskrit, they're taking the verbs and say, make it into an adjective. And they guess what? That's so very gender. So you have a choice. Do you want it to be full of paradigms and all the things you got in the Rigveda, or do you want to deal with gender? Because Somehow, there has to be some kind of thing that shows agreement. I don't have an answer, but in the North, gender did it. In the Andamans, gender does it. In even the tribal areas in the far north of Bihar, some kind of classification did it. We didn't mind gender. And even in the South, except in Kerala, People don't mind saying he, she, and it. And oh yes, and in, when you go even further north into the Pashto area, southern Afghanistan, verbs have gender, but adjectives don't. So verbs and gender are seen as a nice compromise. We don't mind doing that if we didn't have to conjugate verbs. We hate verbs. So you're getting a sense of an Indian thinking, which is much larger than just one language. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Hello, uh, so uh, there are one very really happy comment, like that the Bengali distance is very different than like, this one is uh, about the verb thing. I think even now Bengali poetry, the poets that you are using many verbs. So mm -hmm. the, 
the roundness of the poetry is going right. The interpreter uses adjectives and all. So that also shows the mind. So then I think it's 12th century uh, thing. I think uh, Ben Collins uh, didn't like saying and dynasty and all the oppressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, uh, that Brahminism. So, yes. they, one time, actually, uh, in many of the folklores, they were actually praising uh, some of the uh, Islamic uh, kings who are mm -hmm. equating them with uh, some of the deities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> After the. Uh, I don't know the, you may have seen some of this uh, that I said to you for uh, Brahma, Hoi, uh, Hoi, uh Pegambar. Yes, uh, yes, yes, those who have all their lovely songs. They actually, uh, oh, they are now uh, freeing us from that. So that is a very interesting thing. Uh, so, and, and then the question is uh, whenever uh, some someone tries to guess this linguistic ancestry and all, like we are like always uh, <laughs> this very uh, famous word by Colin Masika about languages. Uh, props up. Oh, that their language is a huge body of unknown language. So, can there be a very huge body of completely extinct language that is having no trace? Because sometimes I think uh, while going through the data that is building that idea on, we see that many of the Bengali uh, words for say, that particular lentil, like mashpala, mm -hmm. like, that kind of words are not completely missing. So, whenever there is a uh, etymology, this missed etymology, we see many of us are not really represented at this work so much. Mm -hmm. So, what is your comment on it? See, Colin Masika, um, his early work was like Southworth's work, where they were looking for which words came from Dravidian, which words came from Proto Munda, which into the, into the Sanskrit. So, they're trying to trace using that. At some point, he got a little bit of a better idea. And he started saying, let me look at the structures, which is the same sort of thing that I'm doing now. He's seeing be below the words. Um, language X is a word. Now, la language X is a term attributed to Platonic Massacre when in a conference in 1883, something like that. I can't, I can't remember the exact year, but in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Language X is that language we can't, we don't know about. That all the words we don't know where they came from came from language X. So I took that word and said, language X is that unknown language we know must have existed in the Indus Valley. So I'm trying to, my chapter three is in search of language X. So it X, he never used the term language X. Everybody attributes it. He just said unknown. And as anybody who knows mathematics, unknown is an. X. So that everywhere he listed as unknown, people call it language X. Um, but I I think that we needed to, I mean, you, you can do quite a lot looking at things like this, but that doesn't ultimately get you very far. The only thing, it's like when you dig up an old grave, you're not going to see the features. You're not going to see the face. You're not going to see the clothing. You will see the bones and you may pull out some DNA if the bones are fresh enough, ancient DNA. And so I like to look at the bones because the bones we know at least are there. And the bones for me is the ground, you know, and to some extent the sounds that if you can trace them. So why, why do I do that if they don't do that? Because they're historical linguists, and historical linguists are a, tra a tradition that looked at all oh, this Aryan word in Sanskrit, is there in Persian, it's there in Russian, it's there in Latin, it's there in Greek, and they were very excited by that, not knowing that um, <coughs> you can take this only so far. Uh, I don't understand, you don't have, have to understand Bengali if you know Marathi, but you can pull out a lot of words that are, are similar. That doesn't tell you anything. What is more interesting is what the bones tell you. So I have to stay with the bones because at least they're there when you dig up the graves. You know? So is that a kind of an answer to you? I, I basically stay away from what I can't answer. So is that a kind of answer, answer at all, which is what were the words in the in the Swahili language? They're gone. They're gone. 
Let's look at their goals. Um, we do need to wrap there. I will, uh, I mean, this, this is the conversation that we we'll definitely continue on the side. There's team sense for everyone. Just a quick thank you to everyone for coming here on behalf of the archives of NCS. We are a public collecting center for the history of contemporary science in India. The archives, if you would like to tour of the archives and if you would like to visit, it's just a little camera if you go out the door and around and down the stairs. Um, please do visit the archives. We'd love to have you. Um, let's all and thank you very much to Peggy for this really wonderful talk. And this is something that we can continue outside. And I hope some of you will answer the question. When you think about how it's all going to be going up, I'm going to be able to answer me or I will be able to answer. Thank you.